Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield gynaecological cancers for finals and this is part of the obstetrics and gynaecology edition. Okay, so let's get started. So just a little bit of information about the medicine guide. So the medicine guide aims to support medical students throughout their entire journey in medical school. So if you enjoy my video today, then please can I ask you to like my video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and post in the comment section below. And also please share this video with your friends. So some of the videos I've made are focused upon helping students be as successful as they can. So I've got videos on how to be successful during the pre-clinical years at medical school, how to be successful during the clinical years at medical school, how to get the most out of GP placements, how to get the most out of hospital placements, and how to succeed in clinical OSCEs. Also, I've got a pediatrics range with high yield topics that crop up in medical school exams, such as the high yield vomiting child for finals, high yield congenital heart disease for finals, high yield pediatric rashes, high yield limping child, high yield genetic conditions for finals, and finally, high yield child with a mass for finals. Now, this video is used in conjunction with other videos to form part of my obstetrics and gynaecology edition and again just focusing on the high yield topics that crop up medical school exams such as the high yield chronic abdominal pain this video in particular focuses on high yield gynaecological cancers high yield acute abdomen high yield obstetric emergencies and high yield sdi for finals so without further ado, let's get started. So in today's video, we're going to be focusing upon gynecological cancers. So ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, cervical cancer are the three most high yield gynecological cancers that crop up in medical school exams. Vulval cancer isn't as common in the general population and therefore it's not seen as commonly in medical school final exams. However, I have I have included vulval cancer just for completion's sake, really. So let's get started. So firstly, let's look at ovarian cancer. So ovarian cancer is responsive to BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. So if you've got a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, you're at risk of developing an ovarian cancer and also you're at risk of developing a breast cancer too. Krokenberg tumour is where a metastatic breast or bowel tumour has led to an ovarian tumour. Okay, so this is really important because in the SBA you might have a scenario where a patient has metastatic breast cancer or metastatic upper GI cancer and now they've developed a suspicious ovarian cancer. So, so this is something that's really important that you keep in the back of your mind for finals. So in terms of signs and symptoms, ovarian cancer unfortunately has very non-specific symptoms and it's not until the disease has advanced that the key signs are really seen. So some of the signs that present with ovarian cancer involves abdominal distension, bloating, weight loss, early satiety, diarrhea, abdominal and pelvic pain. So again, this all sounds very non-specific and it's not until the disease has advanced that these key signs are, are really identified, unfortunately. So in terms of mass, sorry, in terms of tests, we need to do an abdominal and a pelvic examination. So if a woman is presenting with unexplained ascites, pelvic or any sort of abdominal mass, they need a two week referral for ovarian cancer. Now, if the ultrasound finding of the abdomen and the pelvis are suggestive of ovarian cancer, again, a two week waste referral is needed. If they have an elevated CA125, so more than 35 international units, a two week weight referral is needed. And a CA125 is used to monitor the reoccurrence or monitor the occurrence of ovarian cancer. And a laparotomy is the diagnostic test that's used for ovarian cancer. 
So a typical exam question focusing on the test for ovarian cancer is that it might ask you for the diagnostic test, in which case it will be a laparotomy. But if it asks you for a test for monitoring a patient with ovarian cancer or potentially monitoring a patient for reoccurrence of ovarian cancer, then your CA125 would be most appropriate for that. So just to keep that in mind. And in terms of management of ovarian cancer, surgery is offered and platinum-based chemotherapy is needed. Okay, so those are the key features of ovarian cancer that you need to remember for your finals. So endometrial cancer, so this involves the endometrium, so this is the lining of the uterus. So risk factors of endometrial cancer involves polycystic ovarian syndrome, unopposed estrogen, so that's so that's the situation where the woman's receiving HRT but they don't have any progesterone component to it, tamoxifen, diabetes mellitus, obesity and Lynch syndrome or HNPCC, so that's hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. So the most important thing to remember about endometrial cancer is that endometrium responds to estrogen. So if you have a situation where you've got great exposure of estrogen, so tamoxifen, and unopposed estrogen, so that's estrogen without any progesterone component in HRT, these are all risk factors that really escalate the risk of a woman developing endometrial cancer. So the signs of endometrial cancer involves unexplained vaginal bleeding in a postmenopausal woman or premenopausal women who have a change in their intermenstrual bleeding. Now endometrial cancer is typically found in older women so the general rule is any unexplained vaginal bleeding in a postmenopausal woman is endometrial cancer unless proven otherwise. Okay? So in terms of tests, we do a transvaginal ultrasound scan. So if your endometrium is less than four millimeters, then that's considered normal. However, if your endometrium is greater than four millimeters in terms of its thickness, so essentially if your endometrium is greater than or equal to five millimeters, then that's suspicious and you would need to do further tests. Now your definitive test for identifying if a patient has endometrial cancer is to perform an endometrial biopsy, okay? And that's really important that you remember it. And the definitive treatment is to do a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. So please remember this phrase because it does crop up time and time again in exams. And also one of the key things to remember is that we're performing a total abdominal hysterectomy, not a laparoscopic hysterectomy. It's a total abdominal hysterectomy. Now you might think I'm being a little bit pedantic, but this is something that does crop up in exams. So you definitely need to know the exact wording and phrasing of the, ma of the surgical management for endometrial cancer. So I'll repeat that again. It's a total abdominal hysterectomy and a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. Okay. So now we're going to look at cervical cancer. So the risk factors for cervical cancer is HPV strain 16, 18, and also 33, but HPV 16 and 18 most likely leads to, and most commonly leads to cervical cancer. Other risk factors involve smoking, and if a woman has multiple sexual partners. So cervical cancer usually is picked up during the cervical screening program, so that's why it's really important that women do engage with this screening program. Other signs of cervical cancer involves postcoital bleeding, so that's after intimacy, intermenstrual bleeding, so that's within the period cycles themselves, postmenopausal bleeding, so again, your first line investigation to rule out would be an endometrial cancer, um, and once that's ruled out, then you would consider another cancer such as cervical cancer. And another sign of cervical cancer is pelvic pain, so in terms of tests. So women will need a two-week wait referral for colposcopy if they're postmenopausal. 
So the situations in which that's needed is when they're suffering from vaginal bleeding and they're not receiving any HRT. So this is suggesting that the vaginal bleeding isn't responding to oestrogen, but even still, your first line concern would be an endometrial cancer and then a cervical. And then once that's excluded, then you would consider cervical cancer, but just be aware of that for exams. And also if there is persistent vaginal bleeding after stopping HRT for six weeks, okay? Now, premenopausal women will need a two-week weight referral for colposcopy if they have persistent intermenstrual bleeding and a negative pelvic exam, if they haven't attended cervical, if they've never attended the cervical screening program, if the bleeding has persisted for more than three months, if they have new symptoms or a changing bleeding pattern, and after trying multiple contraceptives, the bleeding has persisted. So now let's look at the management. So conservative management can be offered initially. And the next step up would be a radical hysterectomy with lymphadenectomy. So that's removal of the uterus itself and then removing any enlarged lymph nodes. And finally, chemo radiation. So that would be more appropriate if it's some, if, if the cervical cancer has metastasized. Okay. And finally, we're going to look at vulval cancer. So they're not very common in the population. In fact, I would say that vulval cancers are definitely one of the more rarer forms of gynecological cancers. And in all honesty, vulval cancers don't come up particularly often in medical school exams, but I've included here just for completion. So risk factors of vulval cancer, so typically affects women above the age of 65. Women who have suffered from a vulval intraepithelial neoplasia are at risk of developing a vulval cancer. If they have suffered from a HPV infection, if they are immunosuppressed, or if they are suffering from lichen sclerosis. So in terms of signs, vulval cancer is incidentally found during catheterization. It can present as an irregular mass on the labia majora and groin lymphadenopathy can occur and in particular it's affecting the inguinal, the iliac or the femoral lymph nodes. Okay. So in terms of tests, these patients will need a two-week weight referral for incisional biopsy and that's going to be diagnostic. Sentinel lymph node biopsy could be performed and groin lymph node biopsy could also be considered but the definitive test and the diagnostic test is a incisional biopsy and you need a two-week weight referral for this. So in terms of management, women are offered radiotherapy and also reconstructive surgery. Okay. So I just want to thank you for watching my video today. Um, please hit the like button, subscribe to my YouTube channel, post in the comment section below and share with your friends. I just wanted to end the video by taking a few minutes to discuss about cervical screening. So as we've alluded to previously in the video, it's really important in terms of recognising women who are at risk of developing cervical cancer. The smear test itself only lasts five minutes, but one third of patients according to NHS, sorry, NHS statistics, unfortunately, don't attend. So the impact of cervical cancer will last a lifetime. So it's really important that women do attend their smear appointments. So thank you very much for listening today and watching my video and I wish you all the best for your final exams.